In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Pentecost was one of the three major feasts. It was one of three major Old Testament feasts. It was celebrated 50 days after the Passover, and it commemorated the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. The miracles which accompanied it in Jerusalem with the holy apostles mirror the great event in the giving of the law at Sinai with Moses. In Jerusalem, on the day of Pentecost, there's a loud sound throughout the house, and all recognize that this is the divine presence. And there are flames that light upon the apostles, but don't burn them. On Sinai, there was thunder, there was lightning, but neither of them hurt Moses. And there was likewise flames in the burning bush that didn't consume the bush. The disciples on Pentecost felt the Holy Spirit as he filled them and moved them to speak in unlearned languages even as God spoke to Moses and through Moses to the people on the mountain. But of course, the most distinct thing of Pentecost is the Galilean disciples proclaiming the mighty works of God in unlearned languages. That miracle is without precedent. It is without parallel in the Old Testament, except in the negative We heard this morning in the account of the Tower of Babel. Pentecost is the account of the Tower of Babel in reverse. Not only in comprehension, but also in reuniting men into one family, namely the family of God. But there are other miracles at Pentecost as well, those, though maybe these aren't as obvious to us. The disciples had once hidden in fear, in the same room. The room where the Holy Supper was instituted. The room where our Lord appeared to them and breathed the Holy Spirit upon them. This is now the room where the Holy Spirit comes visibly and audibly with flames, with loud sounds and languages. For 40 days, the risen Lord had appeared to them in his body, But they had remained mostly confused and afraid throughout those days, even as he opened the scriptures to them, even as he showed to them that he was the culmination of all of history, of God's divine plan to win back humanity for himself through this necessary betrayal and killing and resurrection of the Son. And this is true even as we see on the Mount of Ascension, where the disciples are with him, and Matthew records for us at the end of his gospel, that they're with Jesus, and before he ascends, it says, some believed, but also some doubted. Even after the resurrection of our Lord, there was still doubt. There was confusion. And then the Lord had ascended. He departed visibly from them up into the clouds. And then they were no longer afraid. Or sad, they rejoice at the ascension of Jesus Christ and they return to Jerusalem to wait for the Holy Spirit as commanded. And they waited those extra 10 days the way that the church always waits in prayer. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they aren't only unafraid and full of joy. But they are also, all things being fulfilled, bold. And when the crowd comes to investigate this great noise, St. Peter walks out and he preaches to them without fear, even calling them to account for what they had done to the Lord Jesus. When Martin Luther preached against Prince Frederick's relics, He took his own life into his hand. Now, it seems to me that Luther was largely naive. He expected people to be convinced by the word of God. I think all Lutheran pastors suffer from this same naivete, that everybody upon hearing the word of God automatically is convinced, behavior changes, and so forth. But it isn't always the case. 
And this caused no little bitterness in Luther in his latter days because things didn't work as he thought that they should. Things didn't go like they were supposed to. God's ways aren't Luther's ways, and his thoughts aren't Luther's thoughts. So there at the foot of the castle, Luther was at least as foolish as he was brave. But when St. Peter walks into this crowd, the crowd that had yelled crucify, and calls them less than two months later to account for it, there's no naivete. He knows what this crowd is capable of. And he knows what they've done. And he knows how hard it is for men to believe. That's the first part of the miracle that's often overlooked at Pentecost. The apostles have been changed. They've been emboldened by the Holy Spirit for this very purpose, to preach the gospel, to preach Jesus Christ died and resurrected. And to preach this to sinners, even if it means that in doing so, they lose their lives. And the second part of that largely unnoticed miracle is this. Some actually believe. They hear the mighty works of God in their native tongues. They hear God speaking through men. And this same Holy Spirit which lit upon the apostles, is transferred through their words to those who hear. And he, in their preaching, causes them to believe. Now, we didn't read the entirety of St. Peter's sermon. And it continues after the quotation from the prophet Joel. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It continues. But after he preaches to them, and he accuses them of killing Jesus... They're cut to the heart. They're accused. They've got nowhere else to go, and so they ask, Brothers, what shall we do? And St. Peter responds, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And then Peter promises, And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And 3,000 are baptized that day. 3,000 are added to the number of the saints. That is 3,000 miracles. We should note, too, that whether or not Luther knew what he was doing, whether or not he was being naive and foolish to preach against Frederick's relics, nevertheless, the Lord did create faith in Prince Frederick. And later generations refer to him as Frederick the Wise. And Luther was spared. In many ways, of all the important figures of the Lutheran Reformation, Prince Frederick is actually the most important. Because if he hadn't been pious not wanting to kill Luther in case he just was preaching the word of God, and just in case God had sent him to rebuke the people, then the Reformation would have stopped before it had really begun. But in the midst of the Pentecost miracles, there in Jerusalem, as even here in Phoenix, there's still hatred and malice. Some hear the languages, and in willful, deliberate ignorance, they mock the Lord, and they mock his disciples. And they say, in essence, they're drunk. Not all who heard believed. The preaching of the gospel always sounds like the raving of drunks to the unconverted, to the unrepentant. The problem with the gospel, the problem with the shocking news that God loves us, that he forgives us in Christ Jesus, despite our hatred of him, despite our rebellion, this problem is twofold. First of all, it isn't too radical or too hard to believe. The problem, at first, is that those who preach it 
actually believe it. High school graduation speakers don't believe what they're saying. And neither do we, who sit and listen to them. They're simply engaging in ritualistic annual flattery that we've all come to expect. But the apostles on Pentecost and Christians ever since have been proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ with conviction. And that makes sinners uneasy. And sinners should be uneasy. You should be uneasy. We all should be uneasy. The second part of the problem of the good news of Jesus Christ that makes some of the hearers mock the apostles is because it assumes and it presumes that the people who hear this proclamation actually need forgiveness and that the world is full of sinners. In my own attempts to witness to people, only a few times have people reacted this way, but each time it struck me as absolutely genuine and probably the most reasonable reaction for an unbeliever. And that is when someone has told me, don't tell me that Jesus loves me. Don't tell me that he forgives me. I never asked him to forgive me. I never asked him to save me. I don't want his forgiveness, and I don't need his forgiveness because I haven't done anything wrong. That, I think, is probably the most offensive thing. To preach the forgiveness of sins is first and foremost to preach the law. We're sinners, and we should be uneasy like the crowd because, of course, we're sinners. We should be like those who dwelled in Jerusalem who asked the the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? The love of Christ is based upon our desperate need for his love. And forgiveness of sins is only good news for sinners. We're sinners. And we're bold to say that all of humanity is too. That all of humanity needs the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Because we've all acted. We've all said things. We've all thought evil and selfish things. We've all lied and gossiped. We've cheated and stolen. We've all lusted and been proud. And we all, in fact, know that it's wrong. All unbelievers know it as well. We all at least have some sense of what's good, of what we should be. But we don't even live up to our own standards, let alone to the standards of a holy God. And we have no right to mercy. We don't deserve to be spared this just punishment. And were we left on our own, we would be damned. So what should we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Well, you've already been baptized. God be praised. Thank God for that. Repent and return to your baptism. Circumcise your hearts, turn from your sin, throw yourself upon God's mercy, confess your sins. And because you are baptized, you are named with God's own name. You belong to him. He has claimed you for himself. But it works both ways. Even as a mother might say, well, that's my son. Likewise, a son can say, That's my mom. You've been given God's own name, and you belong to him, and therefore he also belongs to you. He's your God. He cannot and he will not refuse your call. He's given you his name so that you have access to him, and he's promised to be your God. And you have access to him through prayer, through confession and absolution, through the Bible, through the Lord's Supper. And so repent and return to his name, to his way, to his promise. Return to holy baptism, where the Holy Spirit was poured out out upon you. And God's own word 
made your inheritance. And there you will find your father, eager and ready to accept you, ready to welcome you home, just as the prodigal son did. This isn't the invitation of a drunk man. And thank God it's not the hyperbolic speech of high school graduations. This is the invitation of a sober man, full of the Holy Spirit, who's been authorized by God to preach. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And from that same sober man, quoting another sober man in the same office, he says again, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The law was given at Mount Sinai that the Lord would be the Israelites' God, their God, which is why the law begins, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's the beginning of the law. The Holy Spirit was given in Jerusalem that the Lord would be your God. You are baptized into Christ. You have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Your sins are forgiven. And this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. In Jesus' name.